when I was in elementary school, I was obsessed with my father's portable tape player. I had a pretty long walk to school, and my dad's tape player with its mostly uncomfortable over-the-ear headphones, you know, the ones with the metal band across the top, kept me company over that walk to and from school. Well, until he found out that I'd taken it without permission, and, well, that's another story entirely. Sometimes it amazes me that we have come this far since those old days of 10-year-old Amelia singing her way home from school using a tape player the size and weight of a brick. Nowadays, long gone are those uncomfortable headphones. And now we have more ways to consume music than ever before. But what is cutting edge in the world of music today? Bluetooth LE audio. And since this is a cutting edge webcast, we might as well talk about it. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Bluetooth LE audio is a prominent component in audio innovation today. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Finn Boetios from Nordic Semiconductor and I chat about the what, where, and how of Bluetooth LE audio. We take a closer look at the Bluetooth LE audio profiles, the architecture of Bluetooth LE audio, and how you can get started using Bluetooth LE audio in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Nordic Semiconductor. Hi, Finn. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Emilia. Glad to be here. Excellent. I am excited to talk about Bluetooth LE audio today. But Finn, as a basis for our conversation today, what are the biggest challenges in the arena of audio profiles? So in general, the biggest challenge is that the Bluetooth that we're using for most of our audio devices, it is quite old. It's designed for old products and designed for old use cases. So this has been around since 1998. So all of the profiles and the use cases are old use cases. So we have very complex monolithic structures when it comes to the profiles. That makes us very inflexible. And when we are looking at making a new spec, so specifying the new Bluetooth low energy audio, it was pretty clear from the start that Bluetooth Classic isn't a good starting point. So we started off from the Bluetooth low energy and added audio to that one. So Finn, you said inflexible profiles. So what are those profiles made for? So we basically have two main use cases. One of the use cases is where we have a microphone and we have a speaker. Uh, that's called the hands-free profile because you don't have to use your hands while talking on your phone. That's basically what it was designed for. It's talking on your phone while driving your car. The second profile is the H2DP, high-quality stereo audio. And if I mention this, you might already see the downside from the hands-free profile because if you have hands-free, you will only get mono audio, so no stereo, and the quality will be a lot worse. And then we have the audio video remote control profile. That's for playing, pausing, stopping music, and volume control. Um, so if you look at your headphones while they're connected to your phone, you will see something like this on the slide here. My headphones are connected for calls and audio. And this corresponds to the profiles that we're having. So calls is the hands-free profile, and audio is the A2DP profile. Okay, Finn, let's talk about Bluetooth LE. So how does Bluetooth LE solve the challenges you mentioned earlier? We solve them in different ways. Uh, we have many improvements when it comes to LE audio, but most of them go back to one of these three things. We have the Bluetooth LE isochronous channels. We have a new communication codec. That's the low complexity communication codec, LC3. And we have new and a lot more flexible audio profiles. Excellent. So for my audience that may not know, what exactly are isochronous channels? Yes, so isochronous channels are used to transmit time-bound data. They are very important if you need to synchronize data. So a good example for this is earbuds. One of the really big challenges when it came to classic audio was to actually make earbuds because the way classic audio works is you can transmit a stereo stream. You cannot transmit two mono streams. 
So a device can only connect to one other device. So in this case, you would basically cheat. You would connect your phone to one of the earbuds, send a stereo stream that would transfer it into two mono streams and transfer one of those streams to the other earbud. You will probably be able to tell that this is a lot of effort. And one of the really bad things is one of those earbuds is going to consume a lot more power than the other one. When it comes to LE audio, you can use isochronous channels. So you will have two different streams, one for each earbud, and those will be very accurately timed. So you can get the same data or you can get the audio data from left and right ear at the same time. That's really important because basically the way your brain tells from which direction a sound comes is the delay between when the sound arrives in the left or the right earbud. So if you mess this up even a tiny bit, it seems like the sound is coming from a direction it's not supposed to come to. So this is why isochronous channels are so important, because you can get the timing information at the exact correct time. That's really cool. Now, Finn, you also mentioned low complexity communication codec or LC3. Can you explain that a bit more? Yes. So for classic audio, the codec that's been used is the SBC, the low complexity subband codec. And that worked well for a long time. The main problem with it is the focus was on low computing power and not on low data being sent. So it was made for old hardware where the main problem was you didn't have enough computing power on the hardware. And with the LC3, we have a lot more processing power in newer chips, right? Because it's been 20 years. So when the LC3 was developed, that was done by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, they spent a lot of time to optimize the D and N coding on the codec. So if you compare it to the SBC, you will get vastly improved audio quality compared to the SBC. This means if you're using about half the data rate, you will still be able to get a lot better audio quality. If you look at the graph we have here, you can see listening test score. So we basically took a sample of audio and let people vote on how good the audio quality is. And they got to vote on a score from zero to five. And even the uncompressed audio, which was uh, obviously also a part of this test, didn't rank five out of five because nobody was told which the uncompressed audio was. So you'll see the LC3 is pretty close to perfect when it comes to audio quality. And it has a really good performance even at lower data rate. So even at 160 kilobytes per second, it performs a lot better than the SBC at 345 kilobytes per second. And then you can also vary a lot in sample rate and in data rate, which also allowed you to save a lot more power. So Finn, how are these new profiles better? You mentioned the old ones were monolithic and inflexible. Yes. So with the old profile, you basically had the option to choose between one of two when it comes to how you want to transmit your audio. You could either choose high quality stereo audio or you could choose relatively crappy audio, but we were able to use your mic. Now we have a lot more variation. So we have these top level profiles, which basically are application level profiles. It tells you what application is running. So you can choose between the telephony and media access profile, between the hearing accessory profile and public broadcast profile. That's the TMAP, HAP and PBP on the top. Most of the basic audio features are in the basic audio profile, as the name suggests. Then we have the media profile, which is basically the playing, pausing, and so on. We have phone profiles for receiving and ending calls or putting somebody on hold. Then, very importantly, we have coordination profiles. So let's say you have your earbuds again and you want to lower the volume. You want to have this volume adjustment happen at the exact same time on both of the earbuds. And then you have uh, microphone control settings and volume control. Okay, so how is this LE audio put together. Can you discuss the architecture a bit? Yes. So there's basically multiple things happening at once. We have the audio data plane, which handles the audio stream. So you will have uncompressed audio data that is going into the LC3 codec for D or N coding. And then this goes into an isochronous channel and to the phone or to the earbud. And 
next to that, basically on a different pane, is the control pane, which is the get and gap Bluetooth host that goes through the ACL channel. And the really interesting thing about this is you'll have the control and the audio not on the same pane. So if you're not using the audio, you don't have to keep the stream open. So you will save a lot of bandwidth again, and you can save a lot of energy by just having the control pane open. And at the point where you want to use your audio, that stream is already open. So it's a lot faster and saves a lot more energy compared to the classic audio variant. Excellent. Now, earbuds are a good example of LE audio profiles, right? What does the architecture look like in this practice? Here we have an example of a phone being connected to earbuds. So what would happen is you would have the asynchronous connected oriented logical transport, which is the ACL, that would be connected to one of the earbuds. And at the time where you have an audio stream, you would use the connected asynchronous stream to transfer the audio data. And the same would happen for the other earbud. So you would actually have four different streams happening at the same time. You'd have the normal Bluetooth LE connections to every earbud, and every earbud would have its own mono audio stream. And obviously the phone has to know that these earbuds belong together. So they would be grouped as a connected isochronous group, which means the phone can treat them as one device, basically. So we also need to talk about broadcast audio as well, right? Can you explain this kind of application in terms of LE audio? Yes, broadcast audio is actually a really interesting use case. Because with classic audio, obviously the only thing you could do was a one-to-one -one connection. Broadcast audio allows you to broadcast the connection. It basically works like extended advertising when it comes to Bluetooth, which means you have an unlimited number of devices you can broadcast to. This can, for example, be location-based audio sharing. It can also replace induction loops you would have. Induction loops are basically one giant copper wire that goes through a room. Let's say if you have a public space where you want to enable hearing impaired people to listen to the same audio as everybody else, you would have these audio induction loops. This can be really easily replaced with one LE audio broadcaster. Um, another really nice example of broadcast audio would just be, I can share the audio I'm listening to with a friend of mine who's sitting next to me. That would also work as broadcast, and we would get the same information at the same time. We could even switch it up and have me watching that in English and my friend watching it in his native language. That's super cool. Now, Finn, I've also heard about AuraCast. So what about this kind of broadcast? Yes, AuraCast is the brand name for uh, when you want to use broadcast audio for early audio. It has some special requirements and it has an official marking, so to say. So you can look out for these AuraCast symbols that will basically tell you if it's on a device, that device can do Bluetooth LE audio, which is in and of itself amazing because that basically means you have better audio quality and about half the power consumption. So that's a good sign. But it also means it's able to connect to other AuraCast devices. And these can be, for example, TVs. So you can broadcast the audio from the TV. When you look at the slogans that you're probably going to see connected to AuraCast, that's going to be first share your audio, that's the application I mentioned before. So I can share the audio, for example, from my phone or from my TV at home with somebody close by on their headset. Unmute your world. And this is an interesting use case because in the picture you see here, you'll have three people running in the gym. If you're in the gym a lot, you see a lot of TVs on the wall. But usually you don't have any sound because you wouldn't want all of the sound at the same time. With broadcast audio, or in this case, AuraCast, you could just tune into the channel that you like and listen to that one. You will also find the AuraCast symbol then on the outside of a gym or, let's say, a sports bar. And then you know, okay, I can just go into the sports bar and can watch whatever game I want. Because usually there's like five or six different games running in the sports bar. And then the third slogan is going to be hear your best. Because... LE Audio was initially developed, actually, to provide Bluetooth functionality to hearing aids. So a lot of the focus is to have the technology be more inclusive, so you can implement Bluetooth a lot better into hearing aids. I love this. Okay, so Finn, what does Nordic have 
for this kind of Bluetooth LE audio applications? Okay, the LE audio specification has been at work for about eight years now. It's been quite a long time in development, which means we already have hardware that works for it. So we have our NF5340 SOC. I'll talk a bit more about that one later. But it supports basically everything you need uh, to do LE audio. We made this audio development kit specifically to be able to develop LE audio application. We have our SOC on there, the 5340 SOC. We have a digital microphone. We have an extra audio DSP that can directly drive a headphone load and the microphone. We have an onboard debugger. And we have power management IC on there for charging a battery. Okay, so Finn, if someone wants to use this development kit, how would you expect it to be used? So when developing this, we had four main use cases in mind. One of them is, well, whenever you want to test something, you need an audio source for this, right? So you can use the audio kit as a broadcaster, which means you can just connect it to your PC, basically like a dongle, and then your PC can broadcast LE audio or have a direct LE audio connection. For this, actually, the test software we wrote makes your PC see this as an audio device. So there's no setup needed for this one. The second use case, and this is the main use case uh, that we developed the audio kit for, is to use it as a TWS earbud. TWS, in this case, stands for True Wireless Stereo. So the audio DSP on the kit can directly drive a headphone load, and you can have the input from the mic. So you could use the mic that's integrated on the kit to record your audio. And you can also use the uh, DSP on there to directly drive a headphone load. Then another use case would be the broadcast receiver, which is a similar thing, but just receiving, not sending back the audio. So you would receive a broadcast from your dongle or from whatever device you want to use and just play that back over a speaker. If you want to do something more complex, for example, if you want to have stereo audio or maybe you even want to do active noise cancelling, you will need an extra external digital to analog converter. So any audio DSP that you want to use and you can connect that to our audio kit and test your application. So Finn, what are we looking at here? So this is quite interesting. This is something a colleague of mine did as a little project on the weekend because he plays the drums. But obviously, he has a family, so they don't like him playing the drums. So what he did is he took two of our audio DKs and used them to connect his electronic drum set to his headphones. And this is where you can really see the latency when it comes to audio connections. Because you expect the sound to come exactly when you hit the drum. And with LE Audio being very low latency, this actually worked. So he was very happy about this new invention. Okay, so Finn, if I was going to use the NRF5340 in an LE application, what would it look like? Okay, so here we have three different examples on the slide. One of them would be to use it as a speaker. So you would take the 5340, you could have the codec running on the main processor and you would have Bluetooth running on the ultra-low power network processor. You could connect this to an audio DSP. In this case, uh, the one you see here is an analog devices one that's supported in Zephyr. If you want to run it as an earbud, it would be similar. So you would have a microphone connected to it this time. You would use the Sirius Logic audio DSP that we have on the board and could then directly drive your headphone load. If you want to do something more advanced, like an active noise cancelling earbud, you would need a higher-end audio DSP that can take multiple microphone inputs, and then you can run the noise-canceling logarithms on the application processor. Okay, so what kind of benefits does the NRF5340 bring to the table? Okay, so here you can see a block diagram of the 5340. On the right, you can see our network processor. The interesting thing about this one is it runs at a bit lower frequency and is really power efficient. So when you do an audio stream, your radio is on a lot of the time. So you really want that part to run on as little power as possible. And this is where this network processor really shines. On the application processor is also an M33 Cortex processor, but it runs at twice the frequency. So it's a lot more powerful. So you can run an extra application on here. You can do the SH3 codec and maybe even active noise cancelling. 
down in the digital and analog interfaces, you will see the A2S and the PDM to connect your microphone and uh, speakers to it. And very important is the audio PLL and when it comes to power and clock. That's a highly synchronized uh, phase lock loop, which you will, for example, need to synchronize the audio streams to one another. Okay, so we also need to talk about software as well, right? What does that look like for the NRF 5340? Okay, so the software and the sample, we have all of that included in our NRF Connect SDK. That's the software development kit we use for basically everything. You can use that to program all of our multi-protocol SOCs. You can use that for cellular SIPs. That'll even be used for Wi-Fi in the future. So we have everything in one software development kit. But this specific application, you would run the LE audio controller on the network core because that has to be used a lot and the network core is really good at using as little power as possible. And then your application would run on the application core. There you would also run the LE audio profiles, the LC3 library. You can get this from us as a binary, so it's uh, free to use. And then you would also run the Bluetooth host on the application core. So anything else you want to share with us to wrap things up today? Yes, especially if you start developing on basically anything. Most of the time you'll run into some sort of a problem. One of the really great things when it comes to developing with Nordic products is our dev zone. It's a place where you can get your questions answered. We basically have more than 40 application engineers working full time to support custom questions. Most likely, if you run into any problem, somebody has had that problem before and we have your answers here. And if we don't, you'll usually get an answer within 24 hours. Excellent. Well, Finn, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Nordic Semiconductor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from EE journal.com for more chalk talks head on over to the chalk talk section of ee journal you can't miss it it's right across the top or head on over to youtube youtube.com slash ee journal <laughs>